Hey everybody, welcome to Biters. This is Diane. And this is Marnell. And, and it looks this is like we convoy. got ourselves a convoy. <laughs> it's not just a song, it's our anthem. <laughs> oh, I love Mo Collins. Mo Collins is hilarious. Uh, now, I'm going to get things right out of the gate here. You know I didn't like the episode as much as you did. And you Mo know Collins I is hilarious. really loved this episode, and not just because of Mo Collins, but uh, if Mo dies, we riot. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Although, hashtag where's Wendell? <laughs> right? We didn't see him at all. It was alluded that he was in the passenger seat, but no, we never actually saw No, she made the comment stopped. that he was off watching oh, the kids. Oh, that's right. He was watching kids. That's He's got right. Babysitting duty. <laughs> I totally thought of you. We inherited another kid. Oh man! And you know how I feel. I, like nothing against single moms, but single moms in the apocalypse, your kid gets you killed. Hashtag mom, Jesse mom. and Ron and Sam and Sam. <laughs> Sam. Mom, mom, mommy, mom, mom, mom. Oh. All right, I have to ask you, how did it end? Because mine got cut off. Really? Where did it cut off? Really? So it cut off with them kind of menacing the guy with the dreads, who at first I thought, is that Heath? And then I thought, no, he's just another rando dude with dreads. <laughs> so were we all meant to think that was Heath? Oh, totally. Okay. So they were, you saw where they were menacing him. And he, they shot they, his motorcycle. Okay, yeah. that, And then they tossed the walkie-talkie to him and said, uh, call your friends. And uh, basically, it, you know, kind of lure them here. They Logan was basically saying that. And he's like, and tell them they've made more enemies than friends. Hmm. Okay. So you saw most of it. I can't imagine that it cut off any more than that. Yeah, it cut off maybe a minute. It, what happens is that usually it cuts to Talking Dead. And so the programming for, for picking those up is different. But when I clicked to Talking Dead, they did not capture the, for the last few minutes of the episode. In fact, it, it even went a little late into talking. It had already started by the time it started recording. Oh, so, See, in my watch, I thought it was interesting that um, right after the credits, and it only happens like one or two episodes a season, uh, right after the credits, they show the next time on. Usually I don't see that. Usually I have to go find that in addition to, uh, but it, okay. was, it was tagged on to this episode. So yeah, that's weird. By the way, this is Biters, and we're talking about... Channel four, Channel 4, the season five, episode nine, mid-season premiere of Fear the Walking Dead. And not the Channel 4 in the UK. <laughs> Hashtag Celebrity Big Brother. Bring it back. <laughs> All right. How'd you rate it? I rated it a 4.6 delicatessen. Wow. Oh, you rated it really high. I did. I I did. I don't love this episode. I really like it. Wow. I know. I did not rate it nearly as high. So I gave it a 3.121 cult recruitment videos out of five. Wow. Because it was totally a cult recruitment video. Okay. So... I was going to get to this in our rotting potpourri, but since you mention it, immediately when they got to that end and they're basically like, and we need you, I immediately thought of Starship Troopers. Have you seen Starship Troopers? No, I read the book. Oh, it like the movie is cheesy, cult classic. I love it. Uh, like, Every single time it's on cable, I will watch it. I haven't actually watched the sequels to it because those just look dumb cheesy, not fun cheesy. 
And so I was thinking of the recruitment video for Star Starship Troopers that's at the end of the movie where they're like, we have the guns, we have the ships, we need you. Service guarantees citizenship. <laughs> that's exactly what I thought at the end of this episode. I was like, oh my God, this is Starship Troopers. It was a cult recruitment video. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I do have some numbers. So the he headline on TV by the numbers was Fear the Walking Dead Returns Down. So there were 1.4 million views and about 400,000 in the 18 to 49 group. It was fifth overall for 18 to 49. Hmm. Beat out by 90 Day Fiance, which was at the top yet again. Yeah, I feel like they're ramping up to their like season finale, though. So, yes. I mean, as much as I didn't enjoy this episode of Fear, I can't imagine that 90 Day Fiance has got to be so much better. <laughs> so every once in a while, I, I scroll through the the menu on the the TV for the channels. And I swear to God, there is a channel that plays nothing but Dr. Pimple Popper. Oh, my God. Like, that's hilarious. Back to back 24 seven. Like, because every time I scroll through, there is a Dr. Pimple Popper episode on. I'm like, really? Because I know that there's like a channel that does that with Naked and Afraid because our mom watches that. Mm -hmm. And I, I like... I, I like I totally got into watching Naked and Afraid because uh, when I stayed with mom, that's what we watched. <sighs> so she, funny. she is making me tired. <laughs> I just have to say that. <laughs> that's all I can really say. Well, I mean, so when you're a parent, your kids exhaust you. And then at some point it flips around and your parents just become exhausting, right? Like, that's just the cycle of life. Amen, sister. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. So um, our title, Channel 4. So it's obviously what the walkie-talkie was tuned to at the end. Right. And that's the, that's, that's the channel that they're always on. I don't have they, anything more interesting than that. No, no, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, our writer was actually, and we know this name well, David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick. <laughs> That's a mouthful. I know, it's always a mouthful. So he has done 10 episodes for the main series. This is actually his first as the main writer for Fear, but he's actually written as a staff writer on nine other episodes of Fear the Walking Dead. So, well, David, I think you did well. Diane thinks you did eh. <laughs> <laughs> So he also wrote Some Guy, which Dan Liu, who was our director for this episode, directed last season on the main series on in season eight um, or maybe it was season nine. I think it was season eight. And then um, David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick actually wrote all the way back to Chupacabra in season two of the main series. Wow. So he's been with The Walking Dead for a long time. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. God. So his announced pre-production and filming credits for writing have you seen that no i didn't look a nightmare on elm street oh of course you know my affair with freddy krueger mm -hmm. like i am nearly 40 years old and freddy krueger still terrifies me it's the only horror character that will make me turn on all the lights in the house at night <laughs> Um, so he's also writing the screenplay for Aquaman 2. Which Jason Momoa, love or hate the, the uh, idea, is actually holding up the production of Aquaman 2 because of the huge telescope that they're trying to put on Mauna Kea. Right. It's like the fifth one. So I'm like, how many do you need? Re do we really need another one? Are you sure? Well, you know, I got to be honest. I was like, Jason, as someone who's a diehard Aquaman fan the cartoons i'm not looking forward to aquaman 2 <laughs> you know they could blow us out of the water but um yeah no kidding no i <laughs> no. would just as soon watch the meg again <laughs> <laughs> 
I will watch the Meg 2 with more excitement than I'm going into Aquaman 2. Oh, that's funny. Well, the effects were better. Yes, you, we agreed. If you have not listened, go listen to our episode of reviewing the movie The Meg. Yeah, because it, it was a pretty it was, good movie. It was pretty fun, yeah. yeah. So he's also writing uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, I which, think we've talked about this before because I definitely remember the Freddy Krueger thing. It's just announced, um, but I loved the original black and white Invasion of the Body Snatchers when I was a kid. Like, uh, like I, I was... I, I swear there was a TV in the womb with me because, I mean, Arsenic and Old Lace, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the original Twilight Zone, like, give me a good black and white. So if if this episode is anything that is going to give us a hint to how well his writing is for something that's, like, kind of horror suspenseful, I think he'll do justice to Invasion of the Body Snatchers because the Nicole Kidman movie didn't. Now, see, I think if his writing on some guy gives any hint as to how Invasion of the Body Snatchers is going to be, it'll be good. So I like David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick. I just happen to like some of his other writing more. Right. So it's so pre-announced, there's not even a cast for it. So... They're still sitting around a writer's room with that one. Very cool. Awesome. All right. Our director, Dan Liu, has done three episodes for the main series, including the as yet unnamed episode six of season 10. And he has done two episodes for Fear This and Good Out Here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. He's got tons of editor credits, and he edited, like, 28 episodes of the main series. Ooh. So definitely someone who has worked his way up in the way that production crew often does. Right. And so he's also edited a show that I watch, Salem, which, of course, is about, is a totally fictional fictionalized CW version of the Salem Witches. You know, I never watched that. Was it good? Oh, no, it's terrible. It's like, terrible. <laughs> but, like, it's, it's terrible. Like, you must watch. It's soap opera-y ter- terrible. Like, it's great terrible. Yeah. I I love it. Um, I love the cast in it, too. So there's a lot of great actors and actresses that, you know, appear for like half a season and then get killed off. Spoiler alert! Well, speaking of great actors and actresses, do you want to tell us about our featured cast? I do! So, we did uh, Tess, the woman trapped in her house with the sun. Her name is Peggy Schott, and I love the name. Uh, her Twitter handle and the name of her um, webpage is, the Twitter handle is Peggy Schott underscore me. <laughs> get it and her um internet page is peggy shot dot um so get this she has only been in the film industry since 2011 so eight short years she has 87 actress credits 13 producer credits seven assisted director assistant director credits Six casting department, four miscellaneous crew, three casting director, one director, one production manager. Holy cow, she's been a busy lady. Holy cow. So if you go to her Twitter, um, it is mainly um, her talking about her promoting her stuff, which like... I absolutely support. She's got some great short films out there. Um, And her, her webpage also has a comedy acting reel and a drama acting reel. Um, She is all about the self promotion. And apparently it is working out for the lady because she has got some chops. I don't know anything she's been in except Fear the Walking Dead. Same here. 
But her other big acting credit is a show called Vindication. It's a Amazon Prime TV series. They are in their first season. There are 10 episodes. She plays the wife in the show, uh, Becky Travis. And uh, so the synopsis for the TV series is a episodic faith-based crime drama series that follows a small town investigative work of a detective, Travis. So... I'm not particularly religious, but I'm kind of interested in how, because they they make it a point to say it's faith-based crime drama. So I'm like, what does that mean? So I kind of want to go watch it. So I will probably watch at least the first episode of Vindication on Prime. So, but that's that seems to be her other big credit. Um, if you go to her... her um, Twitter page her bio is actor Becky Travis on Vindication and Tess on Fear the Walking Dead so she is definitely proud of these two roles she um, interestingly has her own YouTube channel and it's pretty That's... much reels and like demos of her acting so she's very good at self promotion yes and it has gotten her very far in eight short years. Um, she is originally from, uh, she's a native of New Orleans and she is, her stage acting career is based in Austin, Texas. She went to the Jesuit, uh, Jesuit New York, Jesuit New Orleans. I'm trying to talk too fast tonight because I'm so excited about this episode. Um, if you go to her web page, and I sent this to you earlier, right? I, I have never seen such an in-depth resume in my entire life. So strap in, here we go. Uh, so in in addition to her eighty-seven film, TV, acting credits, she has theater credits, and she's played some interesting roles. So. Um, she was in A Christmas Carol. She played the gr the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Uh, she was in Chicago, and she played Velma Kelly. Um, she was in Elizabeth, Heart of a King, and she played both roles of Catherine Parr and Anne Boleyn. Uh, she was in something called Nursery Crimes. I kind of want to look that one up. <laughs> because that sounds right up your alley. Right? And then there's a, a play called Secondary Cause of Death. <laughs> Which also sounds right up your alley. <laughs> right? And she was also in My Fair Lady as uh, Eliza Doolittle. But if you go to her skills section of her acting resume, it is so fleshed out and full i'm like i kind of want to hang out with this chick so well and the she... thing that was cool about her resume was it has hot links so like you click on her resume and it takes her takes you to kind of looking at reels and demos of her acting yeah peggy has got her act together so um i she lists her the general sports and i won't I won't go into them all, but she inclu includes like roller skating and snorkeling. She lists what strokes she can do in swimming. So like the backstroke, breaststroke, butterfly, blah, blah, blah. She, her dance. She's a ballroom dancer, Bollywood slash Indian club, freestyle disco, jazz, line, salsa, swing, tap, and waltz. Wow. Wow. Like, she's amazing. That's pretty impressive. So she, um, she's got improv and general sketch. The I thought it was interesting. The dialects that she's uh, she can do is British Cockney and Southern. And I feel like as someone who thinks that they don't have an accent, British Cockney and Southern are at the like 
other end of the spectrum of accents. They are the ones that like have kind of the most twang, you know? Um, so she's also a singer. Uh, she sings country, folk, jazz, musical theater, and pop. Uh, and she is skilled in horseback riding, uh, general and Western. And she lists her driving skills as stick shift, <laughs> which is a total skill nowadays. It's right? a talent these days. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we heard about somebody getting carjacked and the carjacker immediately jumps out of the car because they can't drive a stick shift? Oh, my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> I absolutely love it. So I have never heard of you, Peggy Shot, but you are definitely going places. Congratulations. Self-promotion is totally working out for her. So I will tell you one of the factoids that I loved from her IMDb was that she is the daughter of a sixth generation casket maker who actually made caskets for Interview with a Vampire. Oh, my goodness. I actually did not find right? that. That's amazing. Oh, my God. I just love that. Oh. She's originally from New Orleans, and she is now based in Austin. So it makes sense that she's got the connection to fear because of them record them uh, filming in Austin. Oh, sixth generation casket maker from New Orleans. Is that just amazing or what? I need your family history stat. <laughs> That's amazing. So that is our featured cast member, Tess. Uh, the Everything I kind of saw said she kind of showed an interest in Dwight. But I'm still hoping out for Dwight's wife to come back. So I'm not shipping those two yet. But we will definitely see more of Tess on the show. And I can't wait. I have a comment about Dwight and Sherry and Rotting Potpourri. Don't let me forget. <laughs> awesome. So one of the things that I wrote down about Peggy Shot about Tess was that I really liked the way that they kind of prettied her down. They made her look really kind of dowdy and frumpy. They did. And she is so not like that. When you look at her photo shots on IMDb, she's a very lovely woman. She is. She's got very striking eyes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, so that is our featured cast member. There was a lot in Whisperer's Corner. Oh, good. But before I get into that, I'm going to take a chance and tell you guys about another podcast that I've started listening to. So there is this new podcast called Room 20. Have you listened to it? I've never heard of it, but since I loved Dr. Death, which was your last recommendation, I'm excited to hear about Room 20. All right, you still need to listen to the O.J. Simpson one. Um, but Room 20 is about, it's, a, it's truly a piece of investigative reporting. This reporter thought it was going to take her two months. It took her two years. Whew. And it's about a guy who is brain injured, like horribly devastatingly injured, in a car wreck outside of LA, like in the desert. Okay, this isn't going where I thought it was going, but okay. And nobody knows who he is. So he ends up horribly brain damaged in a persistent vegetative state, or so they say, in a nursing home, which is where she picks up on his story 15 years after he's been in this nursing home. He's a time traveler from the future, right? I don't know, man. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. There's only like four or five five episodes out so far, but it is really good. Why have I never heard of this before? Like, this is something that comes up in your news feed at some point. Because you don't stalk the My Favorite Murder Boards the way I do. No, I don't. Who has the time when there's so much good TV? <laughs> I, knew you were, I was going to give you a hard time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's my little contribution is Room 20, the number 20. Um, the other thing I will say, so I asked you on our last podcast if there was any TV you were looking forward to. Mm -hmm. I've got to say, I keep seeing ads for The Terror Infamy, which is like the third season of The Terror. I was not interested in it at all. Until this season, but right? this season is set in a Japanese internment, internment camp, camp. And it actually looks really good. Right. Okay. So I have to admit season one looked amazing, but like two, three episodes in, I'm like, I'm done. 
But yeah, this season of the terror looks awesome. Yeah, I might actually watch it. Yeah, I, it, I think it looks it's... like they're kind of setting it up as an anthology series like um, American Horror uh, Story. Yes, yes. That's exactly what they are. So you do not have to watch any of the other seasons of The Terror to watch this season. So that's why I'm super excited to binge it on my next unproductive weekend when I'm not baked Alaska. <laughs> oh, I'm so sunburned. I sent you the picture, right? It looks phenomenally good. No, you did send me the... And I told you, Edward, stay out of the, the sun. You're going to glitter. And I obviously do not sparkle. I burn like Cassidy from Preacher. You do burn like Cassidy from Preacher. <laughs> oh, it's not as painful as it looks. It's just ugly. I hate being sunburned. It didn't look like the worst sunburn I've ever seen, but it didn't look fun either. It did not look like SPF 50 reapplied twice. No, it did not. Right? That's like because you are... Lily Fair. Yes, like I need to carry around a parasol everywhere. <laughs> you go. do, and you need to have one of those funny little hats like Cassidy has. Uh, well, I was thinking Island of Dr. Moreau, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, so we're starting at Whisperer's Corner on kind of a sad note. So there was an actor named Dango Nguyen. I'm going to, I totally blew his last name. N-G-U-Y-E-N. -E I think it's a Vietnamese name. Nyan. Um, we, ha we had a set of twins that were, ah. that. that's the last name. And I think that's Nyan. That's how you pronounce it. Well, so he was, he had a recurring role as a guard in Woodbury in season three of Walking Dead. Um, he also was a firefighter and an EMS worker for many years in Athens, Georgia, in Athens, Clark County. And he passed away this weekend at the age of 48 due to cancer. Aww. Yeah, so I shared his information on the Biters page with hashtag Walking Dead family because we truly are a family. Yes. Yeah, and even if you leave the show, you're still part of the family. Yeah. So that was a little sad piece of news. That's sad. Um, Andy Lincoln was spotted on a movie set in Australia, and apparently Walking Dead fans were freaking out. But it turns out it's not one of the Rick Grimes movies. Huh! It's a movie called Penguin. Penguin? Good Lord, I can't talk tonight either. I'm so tired, you guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Penguin Bloom with Naomi Watts. And it's apparently based on a novel by the same name. They said in the article that I looked at that the Walking Dead movies are not in production yet. When do they say when it's going to be in production? They don't. Huh. They better get to step in. I know. It's almost 2020, man. Well, we all have short attention spans, so <laughs> chop chop. Right. Oh, uh, and next up, so Cassidy McClincy apparently gave a little interview where she said that Lydia is un going to undergo a, quote, major transformation in season 10. She says she's a total badass, and it's because she is now using the bow staff. Huh. I think we saw some clips with her using the bow staff in the trailer. Well, I... I'm hopeful that she'll become a badass because I I really didn't like her character um, in the last season. Uh, I, I really do hope she becomes more like Alicia in Fear the Walking Dead and she kind of becomes that uh, strong young female lead. All right, dude, you got to admit, Alicia looked pretty clumsy with the bow staff in this episode. Uh, I loved the whole, oh, you're filming me awkward <laughs> moment because that that's exactly how we all feel with, when we're like somebody's like taking a picture when we're like double chinned or you know from the wrong angle or filming us when we're dropping something like it was like the most legitimate reaction i i loved it yeah i think you just love this episode more than i did I 
I really did. I actually had a hard time picking my goods, bads, and ugly because my good was, I, this isn't my good, but my good was like the whole episode. There were so many parts that I could pick out that were good. I really couldn't find a bad and everything was either good or bad. Like, it, like there's no ugly. Like, so. I'm going to have to tell Tom O'Mara that he's not going to have to tuck you off the ledge, but he's still going to have to do a little talking to get me off the ledge. <laughs> And also aim for the head. Got to talk Steven off the ledge. Oh, I haven't listened to it yet this week because I'm a little late on everything. So I haven't listened either, but I gave some uh, viewer feedback and they responded. So or listener feedback and they responded. So by the way, uh, did you see my new lunchbox? <gasps> oh, my God. And was it Diane LaSorsa that was saying she would make it a first aid kit? Yes. Uh, I think it was Diane. Maybe I it was, it was Colleen. I think it was Colleen Mahoney, actually. Okay. Maybe it I, was Colleen. I loved the lunchbox, and I love the idea of making it into a first aid kit. Did you know that it had a little aim for the head thing on it, though? What? Yes, it it's it has a little sign that says aim for the head on it. Oh, that's very I cool. I showed it to the aim for the head page. Awesome. That's probably where I saw it. Um, I showed it to the biters page, too. I just didn't share both of the pictures that I took. Okay. Well, you come up first in my feed, so <laughs> I wonder why. I wonder why. <laughs> All right. So fan reaction, according to comicbook.com to this episode was, quote, overwhelmingly negative. Right? Yeah. Which is what kind are of you depressing. All thinking? I, we're apparently not thinking the same thing you are. Which, okay, so Diane is very tired. I am very tired. I'm also in a really bad mood. I've had a rough week and it's only Tuesday. <laughs> I'm right there with you. But I loved this episode. So this could be a super interesting podcast <laughs> or, or not. I make no promises. And we're not even there yet, man. We're not even there yet. All right. I'll try to speed it up. <laughs> so the new series has cast an actor named Nico Tor Tor Tortorella. Not even helping you with that one. Um, and Nico is known for a show called Younger that's on TV land and is also known for Scream 4. And Nico uses the pronouns they, them, and their. Ah. Nico is, is non-binary. And I've got to tell you, as someone who has worked fairly closely with the LGBT community now, but who is an old English wonk from way back, I really struggle using their or they in the singular way. Hmm. I really struggle with that as a singular pronoun. And it's not anything about someone's preferred pronouns. It's just simple English. So I um, don't think I have encountered anybody that prefers that. But... Um, I work with a lot of people uh, who are Filipino and in Tagalog, which is their language, uh, they don't have a pronoun for gender. And so That's when cool. I didn't know that when they speak English and they're talking to, to people, they will sometimes can call a he a she and a she a he or him or her. And I when I first started working for the state, uh, I, I noticed that some people got very offended when they were referred to as the wrong gender and they were cisgendered. They were, you know, the, whatever gender they were born as. And I, I just I've never been. And I, I found out that there is no um, there's no pronoun for gender. And I'm like, well, so like that's not like they're not trying to insult you. That's just they have no word for it. They don't make a differentiation you're just human that is really interesting i did not know that yeah um let's see what else do i have charlie adler of course the artist on the comic book says he is done drawing zombies what well so the comic book is done still well no but he's kind of like you know i've been there i've done that i want to show that i'm diverse that i can do more than just draw zombies Okay. And now I'm... he's kind of also got the freedom to do whatever the heck he wants because he's kind of set for life with The Walking Dead. I was going to say, I'm just saying, dude, the iron is hot right now. Strike. <laughs> I think the iron is not so hot anymore. I think the iron was hot like, you know, seven years ago. 
Okay, so it's like lukewarm. It's not quite <laughs> room temperature yet. So he apparently has been approached by both DC and Marvel, and he said, no, nah, I am i don't draw superheroes either. It's really not my thing. So apparently he is looking at doing some work in some French comic books. I, I didn't know this, but comic books are considered an art in France. I feel like they're considered an art here, too. They're a very underrated art form, but um, I like that um, you know, most serious people refer to them as graphic novels. Well, because and I think that I think they're just generally taken a lot more seriously in France than they are in America. At least it certainly sounded that way. So if it's not a zombie and it's not a superhero, what is a French comic like? I don't know. I, he's apparently working on a 60th anniversary tribute to Asterix. Remember that character? <laughs> no. Ah, uh, that was a French character. Okay. Yeah. Nope. I'll have to put a link up to the article if I can find it again. Hmm. And then Paul Tassie of Forbes says, Fear the Walking Dead turning Alicia into Morgan is the wrong way forward. And that was basically his whole review for this episode. That Did way, you He pretty much just said that throughout Did you the see review. Eric Kane's? I didn't see his review. I saw his little take on the photos that were released for season 10 of Walking Dead, but I didn't see his review for this episode. What did he say? Fear the Walking Dead, season 5, episode 9, review. A boring mid-season premiere. Oh, was I watch Was I watching a different show? I think you must have been watching a different show than we all were. I think so, too. I don't know what you guys are thinking. Yeah, we, we just weren't watching the same show. No. And like I said, I'm like, I'm in a bad mood. I've had a rough week. I'm tired. But like, I'm super stoked about this episode. I love I loved this episode. I liked this episode more than any episode in season 5A. Oh, I definitely can't say that. I think if I had to pick an episode for season 5A... I would probably say the end of everything. Yeah. Uh, the That was the episode where Al meets... Um, Isabel. Isabel. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yep. That was a good one. But I still like this one better. <laughs> wow. All right. Um, Audible has teamed up with Skybound to create some new original Audible content. It does not sound like any of it is going to be Walking Dead content, but there you go. Hmm. So if you have an Audible account, uh, you'll be able to access new Skybound content. I need an Audible account because I just don't have the time to read. Yeah, you need to read. I know. It's good for your brain. It is. And I, I used to be a reader. Every once in a while, I get into a series and I binge read like I binge watch Netflix. And I was just telling you that we uh, went to the movie this weekend, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, because I was a huge fan of the books when I was a kid. And that also tells you a lot about me. Um, if you've never read it, if you basically if you're over 40... Um, it is basically Stephen King, PG-13, or R.L. Stein kind of books. It's young adult horror. So, I mean, my first book was The Unabridged Grim Fairy Tale. <laughs> I still think that's a cool factoid and that you've still got it. I've still got it. Yeah. So, uh, Tom O'Mara brought this up, but I'm not sure if we've talked about it on the podcast Sydney Park is coming back as Cindy in season 10. Okay, I think we have mentioned this. I was just talking about this last night. Yeah. Uh, Michael Cudlitz is coming back to direct two episodes in season 10. Okay. They finally released the name of the person that they cast as Dante. So his name is Juan Javier. Uh, My Spanish is terrible, too. Cardenas. And okay. he is known for the series Snowfall, which I think was either on Fox or FX. 
a series right. called Damnation and then a series called SWAT on CBS. Oh, I love SWAT. And Snowfall was on the list because um, it was kind of very boys in the hoodish. And I it just it looked so good. So I'm I'm actually writing that down because I keep forgetting the name of Snowfall that I really wanted to watch it. And I never did. Well, there you go. Now you have even more reason because I'm sure we'll be talking about him as a featured cast member. Awesome. All right, so this comes from the Snap Judgment podcast, which if you've never listened to it, it's pretty cool. I haven't listened to a ton of it, but I got kind of sucked down the wormhole a few years ago because Jamie DeWolf, who is the grandson of L. Ron Hubbard, is involved with Snap Judgment. And he does this incredible piece called The God and the Man about L. Ron Hubbard. <sighs> That just gives uh, me chills when I listen to it. it. I actually put the link up on our Biters page because uh, it is so good. Okay, so I loved the Leah Remini Scientology special, and uh, I love anything having to do with that kind of stuff, and I watch her show. Um, I forget the name of it. It's like Breaking Scientology or something. All right, you need to read the Lawrence Wright book about Scientology. Oh. And Lawrence to, Wright. And you need to go down the Jamie DeWolf rabbit hole because it's really good. So the reason I brought up Snap Judgment, the podcast, is that they actually just recently said in an episode of Snap Judgment that the song Easy Street was actually used by ICE to torture yes. protesters in Portland in 2018. Yep, I did hear that. Oh, my God. Wow. It, it truly is torture. So here's the thing. Worse I than just... Baby Shark. <laughs> if you do not know what we are talking about go listen to our meg podcast you are welcome for the earworm yeah be prepared <laughs> be prepared and i just realized why i liked this episode why i love anything to do with cults and this was the <laughs> join the cult video. This was the join the cult video. It was totally the join the cult video. Oh, that totally makes sense now. Call your dad. You're in a cult. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The very last thing that I have in Whisper's Corner is that the new showrunner for the third season of American Gods is former Walking Dead producer... Charles Chick Egley, who is also known for producing Dexter and Hemlock Grove. I love both of those shows. I will I have preface this with Hemlock Grove season season one. Season two was okay. I think they got a third season, but I'm not sure if I finished the second season. But season one was standalone amazing. And of course, Dexter was phenomenal except for the last episode so i have to tell you i found out that um one of our nephews totally exhausted himself by staying up late and binging um dexter it's not hard to do it's fascinating it was I amazing i will even forgive them the very last episode i'll even forgive them that absolutely how many years of entertainment did they give us i mean six can... seven who can beat a serial killer that kills serial killer? Well, kills, <laughs> right? Kills bad people. I mean, serial killer who s kills serial killers. But yeah, kills people who who got away with it or they think they did. Until Dexter gets them. Yep. So I have one thing to add to uh, Whisper's Corner. Oh, very good. Go for it. <sighs> Did you know that I like horror movies? Have I mentioned that? Maybe once or twice. Okay. So, you know the movie Candyman, right? Oh, right. I saw that. I thought of you. I didn't say it in... Go for it. Coleman Domingo is cast in Candyman. I'm so excited. That's... I see it. I totally see it. I... So, is I... he the title character? Uh, I believe so, yes. Uh -huh. um, this is just posted by comicbook.com five hours ago. Um, 
but I, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of the the original movie. But I will tell you, our sister, who is another real Alaskan housewife now, who actually just got her house today. It closed yesterday and recorded today. Congratulations! Congratulations! So when we, her and I, watched Candyman, and we were like early teen, preteen, something like that. She actually made me sleep in her bed with her, oh but God, she made hilarious. she made me sleep on the door side of the bed so that if Candyman came to get us, she could get away. She just pushed me into him and get away. So we will totally have to tell her this piece of news. We I will fly up there and take her to Candyman. <laughs> I would love that. That'd be awesome. And then we'll review it and we'll have <laughs> yes. her on the podcast. Yes, she can come here and record. <laughs> and we're going to make her stand in a mirror and say Candyman <laughs> three to five times. I because can't apparently that must be how you get him into existence. Right. Aha. Uh -huh. right. I can't remember if it was three to five because I was confused with Bloody Mary. Creepy. But... <laughs> oh, so I just had to add that because, you know me, mm -hmm. I love horror movies. All right, we are like an hour in. Is it time to talk about our good, bad, and ugly for this episode? It was all good. <laughs> if you say so, Thomas O'Mara, <laughs> BFF with Jenna Elfin. See, like Thomas O'Mara's on my side. Super fan Thomas is on my side. He's totally on your side. We don't agree on much, Thomas, but we definitely agree on this. <laughs> so, my good. I thought that we were done with hearing about Morgan's backstory and everything, but they managed to tie it in again. And I love the way they did it because while the whole her house is surrounded by uh, landmines is kind of an interesting thing. I love the way that they slipped it in that it, it he identified with Tess Tess so much because of you know she was trapped in the house with her son and she she had this fear of coming out she was traumatized and didn't want to believe her husband was dead and he just connected with her on another level and I feel like um there was a scene towards the end of the episode where he is, they're all in line for the noodles at the campfire and he's talking to Alicia and he's like, so are we going to practice more later? And she's like, eh, I kind of got my own thing going. I really hope that like that segues into him connecting with Tess. And just because like this is the quintessential Morgan that we know. This is the 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 guy who rescues Rick that, you know, has an amazing episode with uh, the cheesemaker. Eastman. Eastman. Yes. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is Morgan, you know, this isn't the Morgan of season five. A I'm, I was, I loved that they tied that in with his backstory. I, I thought that we weren't going to get any more. I thought that we had played all that out, but we, we still got another drop. I have more to say about that. <laughs> was it in your bad and your ugly? <laughs> it was in my ugly. I have more to say about that. <laughs> All right. So then what was your good? So my good was, like Alicia, I am actually looking forward to finding out who is doing the trees. <sighs> and I hope they don't waste it. It's going to be Madison. Do it you is. Th do you really think it's going to be Madison? Honestly... I'm 50-50. And that's kind of ironic because that's how sure Al was about her. <laughs> <laughs> her landmine identification. So this could go off with a boom or it could be with a, could be a dud. Um, so here's my take on it. It's either Madison or like when I originally saw it, I was like, Okay, I know she's dead, 
but that looks like the filthy woman's handwriting. Like Do you it's think all maybe it's Sherry. No, maybe. I would probably know her handwriting. But I mean, does your handwriting really translate to putting it in giant form on a tree? I don't know. Yeah, I think you go more block letter at that point. You know, I mean, I it's not like you can do cursive on tree bark. I'm not an expert, but <laughs> whatever. I mean, we we've been um, uh, uh, radiation scientists and and uh, aeronautic mechanics, and now we're bomb experts. But you know. Handwriting expertise is just out of our league. Surely, if you can talk about Chernobyl, you can talk about handwriting. <laughs> oh. So, what was your bad? Being a complete hypocrite. <laughs> um, what do you mean? Uh, so, there was a lot of things that I had a problem with, with... Um, the whole, the house is surrounded by um, landmines. And it did not we... seem very useful. Well, and also, on the one hand, I, I get the whole, we have to kill all the walkers before they get to the landmines because the loud booms are just going to draw other walkers. But... What's the best way to get rid of a bunch of landmines? How about a herd going straight over it and getting blown to bits? I right? do have to say the exploding walkers were pretty fun. They were. Especially because our group kept getting pelted with pieces of walker. Okay, but that was part of my bad is I'm like, really? Get out of the debris zone. Like... Stop duck and covering and, like, move about four feet backwards. <laughs> I had other problems with the the minefield. I didn't feel like they were treating it as cautiously. I, th I felt like they were sloppy with it. Well, and then... Like, all of so, a sudden, they're all there? They're all, like, yeah. totally in the minefield? Right. Like, we, we've cleared enough of them that we're sure we have a footpath to the front door. Um, where Tess is not going to come out anyway, you know, but so we don't want to make these big booms, but yet we're going to shoot the walkers across this cor giant corral and make noise. Like, why not? Like, it, it just that that made no sense to me. And then I, you know, my good was the quintessential Morgan. And I really don't think Morgan running across the field a wall willy-nilly like is very Morgan like I just that really bugged me that he did that he's just like whatever I'm just gonna run you know like I think they were trying to imply that he was so overtaken by his distress around being reminded of Jenny and Dwayne that he just like totally ran across helter-skelter I get that. He, you know, he was reaching out to himself like eight years ago, mm -hmm. you know, but you've just seen half a dozen walkers getting blown to bits. Like, are you going to fare any better? <laughs> so I, I really did have, I, I liked the idea of it, but uh, there was a, I had a lot of problems with the whole execution of the scene. Um, so uh, I did, like I said, I had a hard time choosing my bad, but that was my bad. So what was yours? My bad was that nothing about this episode really moved me. Well, I take that back. There was one thing about this episode that really moved me, and that's my ugly. But, <laughs> you know, generally speaking, I was kind of like, duh, 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 duh. okay, come on. <laughs> you know, I just, it just wasn't that great. I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not actually, a, and I was not excited about the whole found footage thing. I think they pulled it off well. Yeah, I didn't and, mind the found footage format. I thought that was okay. No, no, no. And so, like, we were talking before the podcast about, um, we still have to podcast the next episode of Preacher, and you haven't watched it yet, and I have, and... While it is slightly less chaotic than the first two episodes that they aired as one, 
it still feels like like 36 commercials for preacher like just a super cut of the entire season like we're here we're there we're this we're that we're all over the map and it i like as much as we were with this with all of the quote unquote found footage of of everyone kind of telling their stories i felt that it, they tied it in really well it flowed really smoothly i just I feel yeah. like you actually kind of nailed it for me, though, and which was one of the reasons that I probably didn't enjoy it this much is mm -hmm. or as much as you did is that it really felt like a big, long ad for our group. Join our group. Right. Help people. Go right. forward and help people. It felt like just this big, long join our cult. Service guarantees citizenship. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, I, I could see how some people could see it as as disjointed and a little, yeah, uh, culty video-ish. Yeah. yeah, it I, generally was not very well received, which is kind of a bummer. I know, I know, and I just, I don't get it. Yeah, and you know, Andrew Goldberg and Ian Chambliss are really struggling. Hmm... All right. So tell me you're ugly. Was it must have been a good ugly with a 4.6. Okay, so it was neither good or bad. Oh, I do know. That. I don't, but I do. You do. <laughs> but see, I did it again by saying I don't and I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, see, I see what you did there. What did Logan do? Like we've missed this huge chunk. We right? moved out of the blue jeans factory. Logan betrayed us. Everyone's talking about like he knows what he did and it's all karma, Logie. And waving at him from the back of the van and throwing a box to him. And he seems very like when he was chasing after uh, Mo, Mo Collins. Um, Sarah. Sarah, thank you. Uh, and he, he was like, he was very like, help me, I'm desperate. But then at the end of the episode, when he's shooting up Wes's motorcycle, he's like, kind of, he's not so Negan in charge, maybe a little bit governor in charge, you know, so... I'm still on the fence about this guy. Is he good? Is he bad? Like, uh, do, are, are, is he going to integrate with our, our people? Or are we going to kill him? Like, I, he's, I really would love to know what Logan did. Because everyone talked about it. But nobody talked about it. <laughs> I think they'll probably say something. I mean, I think we'll get the backstory eventually. And so this is a found footage episode, so I kind of think maybe we'll get some some backstory or a flashback, flash forward. I, I don't know. Wherever this found footage was in the timeline, I, I feel like we will see what happened with Logan's group. So, but yeah, it was just... <sighs> I, I loved how Sarah was just like, I stuck it to him, you know? It was and kind then, of like what we did to Clayton, but this time it felt really good. <laughs> right? And then Salazar was basically like, he knows what he did. And, you know, basically like, I'll fillet his flesh off too if he comes back. You know, like it, his was very menacing. So... Yeah, I, I really want to know specifically, uh, they they kind of alluded to it in that he he played a victim again, and I, yeah, because he wants the gasoline, and they have the gasoline, and that's all going to come to a head at some point. You know, totally so. one of the reviews that I read today, which probably didn't help set my mood for watching the episode, was, this guy is a villain because he doesn't want to walk. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is a villain because the dead walk we don't <laughs> and honestly i'm like uh, the jews wandered the desert for 40 years you can handle a few miles dude get some better shoes <laughs> <laughs> those were kind See, of rick boots yeah they were cowboy boots weren't yeah. they those things usually hold up so i don't know he must have bought the kmart brand you know, they're pretty comfortable for a short term, but I'm not sure that I would be excited about walking 200 miles in a pair of cowboy boots. 
So you're saying they were meant to be used as we're going to ride 500 miles on horse. There you go. That's exactly right. <laughs> They're meant to be put in stirrups, not to hit pavement. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your ugly? So my ugly was actually a good ugly because I was looking for something to really like about this episode. And I have to say that Morgan's saying that he needed to say goodbye to Dwayne and Jenny, but not knowing how to do it was a genuinely moving moment. Yeah. I really liked that moment. Yeah. God, I just, I, I, I think back episode one I walking know. dead prime i need to go back and watch it again it and will reinvigorate my love for the walking dead if i go back and watch that episode again right i mean we are still referencing that and in a good way like you know that not... and preacher are two of the best episodes of television i've ever watched that and the <laughs> premiere of preacher totally different but two of the best episodes of television that i have ever watched oh man i couldn't be nailed down to that one and then on the spot like this. Oh, I don't want to pick one versus the other. They're, I love them both. I just, I watch so much television. It'd be like picking a, for you, it'd be like picking a favorite book. For me, right. it'd be like, you know, picking a favorite uh, television show. No, I can so do it. I'm making our mother watch Hell on Wheels with me. Huh. Because I figured with it, it being a Western, she would probably like it. Well, she's watched yeah. like... I don't know, four or five episodes with me now. And she looked at me last night and said, do you know what's going on? <laughs> I was like, oh, do I need to explain it to you? <laughs> well, you had gotten her into The Walking Dead when she was there last, right? She was well, kind of I, interested in it. I mean, I kind of made her watch a couple. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Now I'm going to have to figure out a show to like, maybe I'll like buy her the DVDs or something or send it to her. Of Helen Wheels. Yeah. Like her Chrome box or something. Hmm. Or a Comcast box. Uh, no, she's having a hard time with technology. You should send it as DVDs. Okay. Yeah. She's locked out of her Kindle this week. We're trying to figure out how to get her back into her Kindle so she can download books. So if anybody can help with that, you can find <laughs> us on the Fighters Facebook page. How to troubleshoot a Kindle. I think uh, I think our sister is going to work on it tomorrow. <sighs> That's All right. fun for her rotting potpourri you're definitely in rotting potpourri we're definitely in rotting potpourri so <laughs> I have to turn back through my copious pages of notes which actually were not very useful i just kind of wrote down what was going on but right away so when morgan says somebody helped me was it rick or was it eastman i think it was both i think it was more eastman than rick um because he really helped Rick more than Rick helped him. And then Eastman was the one that brought him out of his funk, you know, after his wife and child died. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, if I had to pick one, I would say it was Eastman. But of course, you know. There was a lot of people that wanted to help him on his final episode of Walking Dead. Right. A lot of people tried to kind of yeah. talk him off the ledge. Right. And so. But I think, kinda... I mean, he was referring to somebody really specific. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking it was Eastman. But I, I immediately wrote down Eastman or Rick? If you had to nail me down to one. It would be Eastman, but I would not be shocked to be wrong. Yeah. I don't know. So I, in keeping with the style of the found footage of this episode, I loved the way that they kind of scrambled the intro and the intro mm -hmm. music. Yes, uh, I like I caught that little piece, too. That was good. Yeah, so any one of us who have ever watched anything on a VHS tape that had, like, unwound itself and you had to wind it back, that's how it sounded. And it just, it, I don't know, it hit some nostalgia button in me and I was like, oh, that's so cool. I was trying to place that sound and you nailed it exactly right. Yeah, 
it was a it was a videotape that had either become unraveled or had been taped over too many times. Yeah. Um, poor Ben. He was just trying oh. to go out to get an inhaler for his asthmatic son, which yeah. I can totally relate to. Yeah. Cause man, I, like, I I hope for some sort of culling the herd zombie apocalypse outbreak knowing full well that I will be in the first wave of people that to die. That will be called. Yeah. Yes, because I have terrible exercise-induced asthma. Like, I could not run from here to the end of my block without needing my inhaler. So there is absolutely no way I'm running out of herd or bad humans chasing me or anything like that. So I just feel so sorry for this little boy. And, you know... Seeing what my parents, especially what my mom went through and having the use of like actively available medical technology, you know, I can't imagine having to go out and scrounge for one probably expired inhaler for your child so that they can breathe. You know, so as we were watching June go through the pharmacy, I thought she is the most useful person we've had in either series going through a pharmacy. Except Bobby Stucky was probably pretty close, but would you not take everything? She left so many bottles on that shelf. I don't care what it is. If it's blood pressure medication. I don't know. There's stuff that I probably wouldn't take boner pills like <laughs> there you go probably wouldn't I would, take those like i would just be sweeping shelves into some bins and being like all right let's go you know because even if you can't use them now they maybe they're tradable in the future or there are medications that serve multiple purposes i mean you have um old class antidepressants who are really good sleep medications or anti-anxiety medications. Um, You know, so, I mean, there's just, there's multiple uses for different medications and you'll probably run into somebody out there who needs it, or you could kind of do what like Nick did and be sort of a drug dealer and cut stuff around. And like, there's all kinds of things you could do with drugs. So and there's not much of it left out there. So I'm just like, sh- I in big, bold letters, I'm like, take everything so from the So you're seeing too picky. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she was looking at labels. I'm like, nope, just like <laughs> just straight down the aisle with the aisle. <laughs> You stand right there with a the basket. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, 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 that would, there, there's a lot of places you plan to go when the apocalypse happens, you know, it's like a guns and ammo store or Costco. Cause of, you know, you'll have a ton of food and, and the Costco's have no windows. So you don't have a lot of vulnerability. I've really thought this out. Um, <laughs> uh, and you want to go and get medical supplies. So you go and you raid like the emergency rooms and the urgent cares and the pharmacies and the veterinarian's office and things like that. And that would so be me because I have got to have those inhalers. I know what that's like that, you know, you are dependent, your life is dependent on a medication. And I am actually on the better end of that spectrum because I can't imagine somebody needing insulin at this point in the zombie apocalypse yeah i don't think anybody's going to be able to get insulin at this point in the zombie apocalypse i don't think uh diabetics are lasting too long Mm. anymore Mm -mm. nope all right so that actually brings up uh, something else so that that was a storyline where we first met sherry and dwight with sherry's little sister how does Dwight think he's going to find Sherry outside of the exclusion zone? How does he think she got beyond the exclusion zone if they were all trapped in there? I don't think he's dropped his mission of finding Sarah altogether. I'm sorry, Sherry, Sherry altogether. But just from the way, like, he seemed to be having fun with our group this episode. I mean, you know, he and Salazar were poking fun at each other about. I know Cherry Salazar Dwight was... is a little bit weird. 
Yeah, and I love I love the line where he said, "I am doing the polar opposite of what I used to do," and he voiced that over, and he he was carving a chess piece and we all remember the chess pieces and the chess board that he had in his room at uh the savior compound mm, you know good catch yeah i mean this is this was pre-apocalypse dwight you know and so again i really hope he finds sherry and if that doesn't turn out well maybe him and tess can make a go at it i don't know but <laughs> I just, it was really good to see Happy Dwight. Happy joking Dwight. Happy Dwight is a little incongruous. It's going to take me a little bit to get used to him. Yeah, getting loose to, um, getting loose to Emilio with his makeup off is, because I, I don't even see the burn anymore. That's just Dwight. Like, I don't see any physical deformation or anything. That's just Dwight. It's like when one of my I, when I have a friend or something who either gains a bunch of weight or loses a bunch of weight, you notice it, but it's like that's still just that person to mm-hmm. me. They, they are more than the sum of their parts. And it was really, really good to see the total sum of Dwight come up this episode. So, yeah, it, the, they definitely, definitely were poking at something with him and that chessboard. Um, so I, yeah, I was pretty, um, I don't want to say coincidental. Um, I think we've seen them looting bodies before because I think I've made the, uh, the point to point out that it's it's like if you play a zombie video game Mm -hmm. we have talked about that yeah and so uh finding ben's body and the inhaler on him you know it's it's kind of a one in a million shot he could have wandered off in a different direction or anything like that but because we are utilizing our resources and looting bodies we are discovering a whole lot of things that we need to discover or, you know, we're, we're getting treasure troves of, you know, um, lowering blood, blood pressure pills and boner pills. <laughs> it's like somebody made a bet that I couldn't say that three times in the episode. <laughs> Good thing I don't have to edit that out. <laughs> Well, I thought of you. They can add the asthmatic kid to their collection. Right? Mm -hmm. And Steve, Uh, because I know he's excited to have more cast members. And I'm telling you, like, the Zombieland 2 is coming out, and I loved the first Zombieland, but his first rule, like, cardio. And I'm like, oh, I'm so dead. (laughs) (laughs) Man, if I go without my asthma medication for one day, and I take I take a pill, it's well controlled with Singulair. If I go without it for one day, and I sneeze more than once in a row, I need my inhaler. But that's just if I go without my medication. So, so you'd be remind- fine until you run out of Singulair, right? I would be fine until I ran out of Singulair, or if I really had to do some hard running. Like, not just, I got to jog away from some shamblers. I would I would have to be sprinting away from, you know, a savior group or something. It's yeah, a good they, thing in this world that the zombies are slow. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that whole fight, flight, or uh, freeze, I would definitely be fight. Um, so I legit believe that Al could identify the landmine. So we joke about being a, um, helicopter expert, a rappelling expert, a a climbing expert, (laughs) but her being out in the field with military personnel I really think that she could have come across almost this exact situation before 
and kind of know what she's doing. I mean, uh, when journalists go out in the field, they it's not like they just put a flak jacket on them and be like, okay, point your camera this way. You get briefed on, you know, if you're going into an area that's hostile or if you're going to an area that's friendly and, you know, this is how to handle yourself and this is how to handle a weapon if, you know, you have to. And, you know, maybe they identified, you know, if it's a bouncing Betty, you know, it, that that thing's going to spring up and boom into the air. Or if it's the one that happened to be that uh, Morgan was on. It uh, it just blows straight up from its wherever it's buried, you know. So I I really liked that we used somebody's expertise that they probably legitimately had before the zombie apocalypse. I have to say I was disappointed that I was not even remotely scared for Morgan, though. Of course. Because you kind of knew from the way that it was filmed... Right. And from the way that they were telling the story that he did not get killed by the landmine. Oh, right. Yeah. No. So they they kind of ruined any suspense that you might have had. Would you have been worried about anybody on the landmine? They have got to kill somebody. They're going to have to kill somebody. And uh, my money has been on Luciana, but... Her shoulder seems to be doing very well holding oh, the camera. Oh, she does seem to be fine, doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah, the so. shoulder's fully recovered now. But, and this is a completely out of left field. I don't even know why I mentioned it, except that it was just, it. stuff isn't by accident. And when you viewed the camera lens that Al was using... The colors from it were very bright and sunny and yellow red tinted. And when they switched to Luciana using her camera, it was very dark and overtone and overcast. There was mm, a lot of blues I didn't green. even realize that. And so like when they were trying to figure out how to get Tess out or themselves in or whatever, they kept switching back and forth between Al's camera and Luciana's camera. And I'm just like, I wonder if that means something. Like, does it mean that, you know, maybe we're going to kill Al because she's being filmed in this darkened, gritty color? Or are we going to kill Luciana because she has the the camera that films dark and gritty, you know, like, well, I, Maggie Grace was quite blonde again on Talking Dead. I liked it. I do too, but unless oh. Al finds a, a box of bleach in the ZA, I kind of wondered if that had anything to do with her future on the show. Right. They are done filming for this season, so that is yet to be known. Um, I think that she's a natural blonde. All mm, the other no, stuff. No, she's not. Mm -mm. Okay. No, I'll love she the definitely other stuff. has roots. The, a lot of the other stuff I see her in, she's she's, blonde. Uh, yeah. she's a blonde, and it it very well suits her. But uh, yeah, I mean, unless she finds a box of bleach, or if they are actually going to continue to dye her hair for episodes, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That was the first thing I thought when I turned on talking tonight. Was ooh, she's awfully blonde. <laughs> Yeah, and then to have Grace be doing the thyroid check, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just, I, we've we've known that she's been on borrowed time for a while. And she says she's on borrowed time. I'm not really sure that I buy that she's on borrowed time. Ditto. And then we have too many kids. We have to get a rid of a few of them. Mm -hmm. They're letting Walker sneak up on their camp when they're in an open field. It's not like these walkers came out of the forest that was three feet away from you. Why is there not a Dale up on one of the trucks doing a 360 perimeter view? Like, walkers don't just sneak up on you like that. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. That bugged me. <sighs> hmm... I So I thought of you, I thought, where did Ben get all those landmines? Hashtag extreme prepper. <laughs> oh, love that show. Doomsday preppers. 
I thought a lot in hashtags during this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I thought hashtag pod tie in the apocalypse. Oh, and so you isn't pad thai one of those that's usually made with shrimp and or shrimp oil? Shrimp and or chicken. You don't necessarily you don't use shrimp oil. No, it's usually. Um... Oh, I'm I'm thinking of pancit. So, uh, like I was saying, I I work totally with a lot different of, culture. Uh, yeah, I work with a lot of Filipino people, and God bless them, they make pancit. And every once in a while, one of them will take pity on me and not make it with shrimp oil so that I don't die while I'm eating it. Because in addition to be a horrible asthmatic, I'm deathly allergic to shellfish. And it's an adult onset allergy, so I know what I'm missing. Mm, and That's a bummer. I go to all these work potlucks and there is this delicious pancit all around me and I can't have a drop of it. I'm like, maybe if I just, like, have, like, a bottle of the liquid Benadryl right here and somebody watches me real close, you know? <laughs> uh, it sounds like you need to eat it with your EpiPen in hand. Yeah. Probably. <sighs> well, I don't know that I've got a whole lot of anything else. Yeah. I mean, John Dory probably had the best lines in the episode talking about a proud tradition of eating noodles around a campfire and right. uh, and talking about the delicatessen and the ugly mustard. Yeah. So and I thought it was interesting the last time we ended on them eating noodles around a cast uh, uh, fire was it was a somber moment. Mm hmm. Yeah, this actually, and you know, it, I liked it. I felt like it was really candid with the cast. I felt like they were probably sitting down as a cast and enjoying a meal together. Yeah. You know, I felt like it was a genuine moment when they were all eating together. I thought that was cool. Yeah. And they're also, every time I'm screaming at my TV about something, they solved it this episode. So... When Logan's crew was shooting up the motorbike, I'm like, oh, yeah, because it's a zombie apocalypse and you have 500 rounds to spare. Well, later on, they were like, we got plenty of ammo. And I'm thinking, not for long. <laughs> not if you keep doing that. Yeah. And I mean, what's our one big gripe? Like, gas goes bad. Well, all of a sudden, we have the fountain of youth of gasoline. And so... You know, we we kind of tend to pick things out and it seems like they're picking up on that and kind of uh, evening the keel on our complaints. So I thought that was a little funny. Well, they have a long way to go to make this season redeemable. And I think they're off to a good start. Uh, well, good. I hope that I join the crew at some point. <laughs> Come on and join the convo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So we still have to do our podcasting for this episode of Preacher. Yes, but, we have to uh, do Preacher this week. Yeah. So we, uh, we got to get to bed. I know. I still have to go eat dinner. Ugh. I have to finish a bottle of wine. This is how great my weekend's going. I uh, was on my way into podcasting room and I was like, oh, I'm going to go out to the where we store all of the wine in our, our beer and wine and liquor fridge. It's out in the garage. And I come in, I got the bottle of wine. I'm halfway down the hall and I'm like, yeah, I probably should get a glass. <laughs> well I'm... my my uh fridge is full of wine and beer right now which is not typical oh uh, mm -hmm. i've only got like six bottles and i feel like i'm running low <laughs> that's not even including like the Angry Orchard and the Alaskan beer and like the literal gimp cage of 
liqueurs and alcohols, bottles of vodka and whiskey and rum and things like that that's in my garage. By the way, our sister found an amazing pear cider. It's called Hmm. Perry, P-E-A-R-Y. Hmm. Yeah, it was good. Like, Like the name. Yeah. All right, my dear, we should probably wrap this up. We should probably wrap it up. God, you just talked all night. Ugh. <laughs> Couldn't shut her up. <sighs> did I talk you down? Or did I talk um, your rating up? No. Well. No, I'm still in it for the long haul. I've invested too much of my life in The Walking Dead. But no, you didn't talk me off the ledge on this one. And nobody rained on, uh, rained on my parade tonight. <laughs> I still like what I like. Whatever. I don't care if it's popular. I'm a trendsetter. It's not popular. You are a trendsetter. Hashtag unpopular opinions. (laughs) All right, everybody. Next week's episode does look pretty good. We are back in a mall. So that's exciting. The Day of the Dead episode. Or the Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. Yeah. Yeah. This one kind of seemed like the, the Resident Evil convoy you know, when they were out in the desert with, um, uh, yeah, they were moving through the desert on trucks and buses and ambulances and oil tankers and stuff like that. I kind of felt like that. Yeah, so I, I like, totally oh. haven't watched Resident Evil. Oh, okay. I know. You're the horror queen. I'm not. Yeah, I see. I keep, I feel like they keep tying into all these other, and mostly horror, but other genre movies. So, like I said, go watch it again and think Starship Troopers. <laughs> The book, not the movie. No, the movie. <laughs> It'll take you far less time to get through. I'm just saying. <sighs> the book is a classic. Robert Heinlein. Well, you have a week. Choose one. Book or movie. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. All right, but until then. Just remember. Take Take it one one dead day day at a time. time. All right, everybody, have a good week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Bye.